Hello again, everyone. My name is Cecile McGuire. I'm the Associate Director in North America at the Faculty of Medicine from University of Queensland. Um, I'm going to introduce my fellow panelists, but before I do that, I just want to introduce actually my colleague, Brian Mallon, who is the Marketing Manager for the Faculty of Medicine at the University of Queensland, and in particular focuses on the UQ Oxford MD program. This is the final webinar that I'm going to host for the UQ Oxford MD program. I just want to say thank you to Brian for all of his hard work um, behind the scenes in, in setting up the webinars, monitoring registrations and developing content and so on. I'm hopeful that in the future you may see Brian in front of the camera, but right now his expertise is so welcome behind all of the infrastructure. Joining me today um, is my colleague Sue Barost from uh, the University of Queensland Oshner Clinical School. So Sue is our Director of Enrollment Management. She and I are gonna share some of the presenting um, responsibilities today. And we are also thrilled to be joined by a student panelist. So Angie Hinchman is a current third year UQ Oshner MD program. Um, the, the webinar um, today, oh, sorry, fourth year, I just got corrected. This is why I can't do this without Brian. He's off screen, but he just uh, held up some fingers to, to correct me. So my fault is Angie, a fourth year um, MD student, a really busy time for, for our fourth year students. So we so appreciate your time. We've got a formal uh, PowerPoint presentation that we're going to run through, but before we do that, Angie, I just wanted to ask you to say a few words and we can you know, talk more about this as, as we go through the presentation about your journey to the UQ Oshner MD program. Thank you, Cecile. So she's right, I'm a fourth year medical student this year. Um, actually just finished my clinical duties. I'm originally from all over the place, a lot of the Midwest and some time in North Carolina. I did my undergrad at the University of Wisconsin in Madison. So if any of you are Badgers out there, me too. Okay, so um, a big reason why I chose this program is because I have an interest in global health. Actually, one of the um, stories that I first learned about um, when I was in high school was the Marley K. Zeus case. She was a case in Haiti. She had McCune Albright syndrome. And all I could think about was I want to be part of this uh, this thing, this um, career path that would help me help people like her. And so um, when I found out about this program, there's an opportunity to go to Haiti, I was completely sold. And so here I am four years later. Thank you so much. And you're gonna have a chance to hear more from Angie as our webinar continues. We're also going to be open to questions. We'll, we'll try and hold off to the questions to the end, but feel free to use the chat function to send through any questions that you might have. And we're open to questions about all aspects of studying medicine at UQ and Oshner Health. I'm going to start sharing my screen so I can show you the PowerPoint slides that we've prepared. All right, so I'm just going to run through the introductory slides. These are the panelists as I've introduced them. So I'm going to start by just telling you a little bit about the University of Queensland. So it is um, one of the top 50 universities in the world. Uh, we're located in Brisbane, which is the capital of, state, of the state of Queensland, the Sunshine State for um, Badgers and people from Wisconsin or the University of Wisconsin. This is an important detail. Uh, you know, we have great subtropical climate here in Brisbane. Um, we're at, administratively, the university is separated into six faculties. So the medical program sits within the Faculty of Medicine. Um, we have over 30 teaching and research sites, including three university campuses in and around Brisbane. And we have eight research institutes. And that's an important um, number to know. We'll talk a little bit more about some of the research opportunities that are available to medical students at UQ, as UQ is one of the top research universities in Australia. So just over 10 years ago, um, UQ partnered with Oshner Health, um, which is located in New Orleans, and they have over 40 hospitals, 100 health centers across Louisiana, um, in excess of 1,300 physicians, they also um, teach postgraduate medical education. They have over 90 medical specialists and they are consistently ranked as the number one um, hospital in Louisiana. So the Doctor of Medicine program, it's, it's your fairly standard four-year MD program. What we've done is design it to graduate global doctors for tomorrow. So it's a unique model that allows US students to train across the two continents 
and we leverage the strengths and resources of the two respective institutions. Um, we have a 95% match rate for graduates from this program into US uh, residency training programs. All of our graduates are eligible for ECFMG certification. Um, we can talk more about that if you have any questions, but in a nutshell, that is the Educational Commission for Foreign Medical Graduates in the US, and they certify and credit all um, non-US medical degrees for uh, physicians looking to train in the US. And all of our graduates as well are eligible to practice in all 50 US states and are also eligible to practice in Australia. So we're going to walk, walk you through the program and how you will learn and we divide it into phase one and phase two. So phase one um, happens when you're at the University of Queensland in Brisbane, Australia. It's the clinical preparation in years one and two. You'll study basic and clinical sciences, research, ethics, public health and more. So some of the um, interesting aspects of our program is we have an integrated case-based learning system that we use and with early patient contact. So in years one and two, you will be assigned to a CBL group. You'll be around 10 to 12 students and each group is led by a clinical tutor. You'll also um, have clinical skills uh, coaching in years one and two and that happens in some of the teaching hospitals that we work with here in Brisbane. Um, we're going to talk more about the support for USMLE um, preparation in particular and also the other student support that's available and you have the opportunity to incorporate research into your medical degree. So I might ask you to talk a little bit about phase two and the um, hands-on clinical practice that's available in New Orleans. So you're just on mute, if you can unmute. There we go, thank you. I'm sorry, I was trying to get that to work. No worries. And, okay, and let me expand my screen. Thank you, sorry about that. Okay. So phase two, that's when you get to come to New Orleans and, and join me on my side of the world. And that's where you start your actual clinical practice, where you'll learn your clinical skills, clinical knowledge, and actually have the hands-on rotation through our hospital system. So it, it includes the practice of medicine and surgery and different areas of um, specialty or women and children's mental health, OBGYN, PEDS, all of the specialties that you will rotate through. And then in your fourth year, you will select certain areas to go to. It does include a trip back to Brisbane and you have some electives. You will rotate through Ochsner Health System and also some of the New Orleans other uh, hospitals like Tulane and LSU. And you have some electives as well. And some advanced hospital practice specialties include anesthesiology, ICU, ophthalmology, emergency, ortho and the med specialties. And then primary care is uh, really one of the strongest areas for our school and what interests most of our, a lot of, a big percent of our, percentage of our students. And our hospital has been in place since 1942 and it's been considered a, a forefront in the city and now throughout the Gulf South. Okay. Thank you, Sue. That's a great overview. And I think I'd like to just also share with students the, the feedback that we've had, not just from our colleagues at Oshner, but also, um, you know, from other um, overseas placements when we've sent some of our Australian or other international students to different hospitals overseas for electives or so on. Is, the feedback is that our students are very well prepared, you know, going into the clinical practice years, that they get a good grounding in clinical skills in years one and two. And that really helps them when they, they start cycling through the, the clinical rotations. Research opportunities. So I mentioned the fact that UQ is one of the top uh, research universities in Australia. Um, they are usually in the top three Australian universities in terms of research funding that they receive, both from government and industry. Oshner Health also has um, a strong tradition of, of research. Um, so 
there are a few ways that you can um, expand the research opportunities when you're in the program. Um, and that ranges from uh, you know, doing a, a Master of Philosophy, so a research master's, or some students do choose as well to do uh, the MD, PhD uh, program at the same time. So we have um, the Director of Research in the MD program, Professor Di Ailey. She's done a couple of webinars for us this, this year talking about research opportunities. And so um, he, she also has information on our website about some of the research projects that students are able to, you know, possibly be involved in. So if you haven't attended one of her research webinars, they're available on our website. You're also welcome to reach out to Professor Ailey directly and just ask about research options, you know, when you are um, an MD student at UQ. Student support is a really important area for us. Um, we want to make sure that you know, our students are supported to have the best you know, chance of success in the program. I just want to ask my colleague Sue again to speak specifically about the um, Austrian Medical Societies as well as the OMSA Student Society. Okay, thank you, Cecile. Um, Yes, the, uh, we have, uh, I've spoken to many of our students that's on campus and they do stress to me about the amount of support that they feel that they've received. There is the Medical Student Society and students take part in that. They act as ambassadors to our school as well and meet with uh, students and uh, address their issues that come up throughout the two years when you're on campus with us. So the medical society is an important part of our school. And then we uh, have the, I'm sorry, the OMSA, the, the Oshner Medical Student Association is a very important part of our school. But besides that, we have the UQ Oshner Medical Societies. And that's composed of five physicians that head up the five societies. And the five societies are represented by the five physicians that founded Ashner. So the five founding physicians and the name of each one, like the Alton Ashner Society is one, and there, there are four others for the five founding physicians. And the purpose of the societies is for that physician that heads the society to mentor the students. And our class sizes are small in comparison to other schools. So this gives you a unique situation to really get to know your uh, society lead and who mentors you throughout all four years, even though you are in Australia for the first two years and your society lead is in New Orleans, you are still mentored by that person throughout your whole four years. And it's, uh, if they help you through any kind of issues that you might have during the entire time and then help you with your preparation courses to pass the step exams and the USMLE, okay? And, um, and then there's also, besides the Ashton Medical Society, there's also the one in, in the University of Queensland as well. So Sue, so I'm glad you mentioned that, you know, contact with the head of each uh, society starts, you know, right from year one. And, you know, generally we're able to welcome the society heads on an annual visit to the University of Queensland, obviously this year, you know, the pandemic has curtailed international travel, but there's been lots of, you know, virtual contact and so on. And I understand, you know, from talking to some of my Oscar colleagues, there's also a bit of a social and competitive aspect to the society. So do you maybe want to talk about that a little bit more? Well, you know, Cecile, I, I, that's a good question because I see on our leaderboards they are in definite competition and I don't know what they're in competition for. And I think it might be community outreach and that they're involved in these different types of community involvement and they get points and they are, they are definitely in competition because I can see on the leaderboard who's in first place and how close their the second competitor is. And so they're all vying for, for first place so that is, is it correct? Am I correct that it is maybe community involvement and service yeah. oriented? I, I can elaborate a little bit more on this. So we're kind of divided. They like to kind of describe it as like Hogwarts houses. You're randomly assigned to these houses and um, you're given points based on um, 
different kinds of participation. So community outreach volunteer hours are one of them. Um, research publications, first authorship are, you can get additional points. Um, I think if you do any kind of presentations, how you score on your um, shelf exams. Um, so things like that, there are like multiple different ways to earn points for your society. I think uh, also um, blood drive, participating in the blood drive, you can earn points. Thank you. So yeah, so no, no Quidditch matches to, you know, take out the ultimate champion. And my understanding, Angie, is that all you win is the glory of being the top, you know, medical society for that year. But I think it's, it's a lovely way to, you know, make sure everyone's involved and, and supported. And I think it's a really important um, topic, especially in this year. It's been so challenging for so many people. And um, we also have, you know, dedicated medical student support services here at the University of Queensland that are, that is accessible to all of our students. Our, our Dean of Medicine at UQ is a psychiatrist by training, so he recognizes the importance of, you know, that additional support to, to help, particularly international students who are away from, while they're at UQ, you know, maybe away from their regular support networks and that. So I think, you know, feel free to, if you have any more questions about the different types of that are available, but just be reassured that you know you are well looked after as a medical student. I'm going to move on to the next slide, and Angie, I might ask you to talk again. So this is some of the details around some of the USMLE preparation and support that we offer to students in the UQ Oshner MD program. And I just wanted Angie to talk, you know, about how she prepared, you know, for USMLE Step One and and Step Two CS and CK. So. I guess the main thing I will stress is that you can never, you can't start soon enough to start reviewing for this exam. It's a big one. Um, a lot of the things that uh, UQ Optioner gave us were like these um, resources that are listed on the slide here. The ones that really stood out for me is um, First Aid and the U World. These are like bread and butter for um, studying. On top of that, we also have a student led um, peer study group. Um, usually led by um, a senior student. Sometimes I think we'll have somebody who's there on rotation will take over and we'll just kind of, when we come back to Australia, we do it or we'll do it through Zoom, depending, obviously this year was unique. Um, so that was really helpful. We have peer study groups um, and like led by the second years for the first year. So there are a lot of ways you can, um, that there's a support. Um, yeah, I think those are the main ways that um, the school supports um, step study. Thank you, that's a great overview. And I think, I, I love that message, it's not too early to start studying. And obviously, um, you know, students in this uh, program are required to successfully sit USMLE step one before they can continue into year three. So it's crucial that you know, you don't leave all the studies at the last minute. I, I heard that comment before about USMLE and step one per se, you know, I've heard students say like, they take that everywhere with them so that they have the opportunity to study it, you know, when they have a few moments of downtime. So feel free again to reach out if you have any further questions, but I think we'll, we've got a slide that'll show you, you know, the results of our current students on USMLE and so you can be assured that you'll be well prepared for it. Here we go. Here's our, our analysis of how our students have gone um, in, in the USMLE scores. And you can see um, for the last three classes, you know, the average score of students who've taken it, the first time pass grade, and so on. All of this information is also available on our website, so you can view it there as well. We talked a little bit about, you know, the um, student societies and, and Sue mentioned, you know, some of the advising uh, that they provide. And so um, you're, we're very fortunate in, in accessing the resources of our Oshner colleagues. So the society that might not necessarily be the head of a residency training program at Oshner, but they're going to have great contacts. And so they're able to arrange, you know, if a student shows an interest in a particular um, residency program, you know, talking to the person who heads that training program at Oshner, you know, about what they need to um, have, you know, in order to be a competitive applicant and so on. Um, they obviously work with you on math strategies, looking at the timelines, mock interviews, uh, advice with the application, and so on. Um, Angie, I know we had talked about this before, but is there anything you'd like to add to you know, the um, residency advising? 
I would just emphasize that all the faculty on, remembers what it was like for them going through the match and they're extremely supportive. Um, I applied for ob guy this year and my society head is not ob guy And I actually had great support from the entire department of people making phone calls for me to help me get secure interviews. Um, my mentor reviewed my personal statement and did some great edits. You know, like you get a lot of support even if your um, society head isn't in the specialty that you're pursuing. I, I mean, that deals with everything that I've heard from my Oshner colleagues. I think they're almost as, you know, proud of the outcomes of our students as the students themselves. They, they are fully invested in making sure that they see successful matches as well. So there's a real celebration, you know, on, on match day when the results come out. This is just a breakdown of our residency matches from 2013 to 2020. So we're very proud to see, you know, the number of, of our graduates who do stay at Oshner for residency training. Um, and then you can see we have quite a high percentage as well that match to primary care, which is a, you know, an area of need both in Australia and in the US. We are so proud and, and work very hard to maintain and, and you know, hopefully increase as well our residency match rate. It, it, it's the equivalent of you know, most of the top US medical schools as well. Um, and we're also hopeful to, you know, increase our residency matches in Southeast um, the U.S. Um, obviously, you know, for the geographical location of our Oshner colleagues, but also a, a, an area, you know, an underserved area in the U.S. as well. These are some of the highlights. Now, we have more detailed information, you know, on our website, but this just gives you um, an overview of some of the highlights of our match results. You can see that it goes across disciplines and it's geographically spread out as well across the US. And this, we love our maps in Australia. Um, and so we love showing this one and showing you where some of our previous graduates have matched as well. Um, I always look at this and see, you know, the, the Midwest, uh, you know, doesn't have too many matches yet, but I'm sure, you know, as we head into the next 10 years of this partnership that we'll see um, residents matching in those in those states as well. I'm going to talk you through now the academic requirements for the program. So just to give you an overview, we take about 90 um, students into the UQ Oshner MD program. And students in that cohort are required to be U.S. citizens or permanent residents. You'll be, while you're here at UQ in the first two years, you'll be part of our greater med school cohort. So we have just under 300 Australian students. Um, and when it says provisional and graduate students, we have two pathways. Um, so the majority of Australian students come in to UQ after year 12. They complete a three-year undergraduate degree and then um, continue on into the four-year MD program. We also have Australian students who graduate from an undergraduate degree, you know, either from another institution or AQ, and they come into the four-year MD program. We also take 90 international students into our program, a large number of Canadians, but also students from Singapore, China, Hong Kong, Taiwan, and so on. So you are a part of a you know fantastically diverse cohort of medical students. In your CBL groups, you won't be with just U.S. students in the UQ Oshner program. You'll be with Australian students, other international students. And so you'll have the opportunity to make friends and connections, you know, with medical students from all over the world. Our entry criteria are quite, quite straightforward. And, and I was speaking with a prospective student this morning and he was asking me because I think most of the U.S. students are very familiar with entry requirements for U.S. medical schools and ours, you know, tend to look a little bit different. We need a minimum NCAT score of 504 um, and it has to be completed within the last three years. We um, don't combine NCAT scores. We don't, we don't necessarily need your most recent score to meet our, our minimum as long as you have an NCAT score that meets the 504 minimum. We need a GPA, a cumulative GPA, of a B average, and that can, that it will be your most recently completed degree, so it can be a bachelor or a master's degree. Students that meet those two minimum requirements are then invited to attend our multiple mini interview. Um, obviously, this year they were all virtual, and most likely that will continue in 2021. 
For the 2022 intake, we're also introducing prerequisites. So all students will need to have, have successfully completed these two subjects or the equivalent, integrative cell and tissue biology and system physiology. So we've been getting a lot of questions about these prereqs, what we're you know, hoping in future that we'll have a credit database that will be able to say, you know, this course at this particular US institution meets our prereq requirements. But because this is the first time we've introduced prereqs, we're not quite there yet. So feel free to reach out directly with any questions. And on our website, we have information about the two UQ courses that um, we need to assess your prerequisites as, as being the equivalent of. So they are two second year courses. So integrative cell and tissue biology and system physiology. It's a big investment, you know, to study medicine at the University of Queensland and the UQ Oshner MD program. Big investment in time, distance, and money. So our fees are payable in US dollars. This is the um, indicative annual tuition fee for 2021. So just over 67,000. US dollars. We do, um, we have a financial aid office that is very experienced with the US uh, financial aid loan system. And so uh, what we have done this year for every offer round, we've actually held a webinar with students who received an offer. So they can hear from representatives from our international mission financial aid office about how to accept their offer, how to um, submit financial aid, paperwork, and so on. It's not common in Australia for institutions to have a financial aid program. So the majority of students in the UQ Austria MD program are on some form of US financial aid. Um, students in pay per semester for fees or in phase two, you would pay per rotation. So you don't have to pay the full tuition fee at the beginning of the program. As part of the offer acceptance, you're required to pay a deposit. And then the remainder of the semester one tuition fees are payable at the beginning of the semester and then so on for following semesters. Application process, we have an online application form. So the applications are opening this month. You can submit an application at any time. It won't be assessed until it's complete. So that would include the transcript from your most recently completed degree and a valid MCAT score. Um, our multiple mini interviews are held from March to October. So the first MMI round will be in March next year. And then the first offers will go out in April next year and then so on throughout the offer cycles um, until November, 2021. This just gives you an overview of our 2020 cohort demographics, just to give you an idea of you know, the age and, and gender balance of, of our cohort um, and also some academic requirements. Um, you're, we welcome, you know, any eligible applicants to join us for the 2022 intake. Um, and you, we also are offering students the chance to talk one-on-one -on -one, either to a member of the um, enrollment management team or to one of our current students. So if after the webinar you have more questions, please feel free to reach out and you can book a one-to-one -one Zoom meeting. With, with a staff member or a student. That's the end of the formal presentation. So I'm going to stop sharing the screen and we'll start um, going through the questions on the chat line. Um, I'm just going to shoot questions to one or other of my fellow panelists um, and keep the questions coming. We've, we've, you know, we've got lots of time left to answer any questions. So I've already answered the one about this program and open to US citizens. So this cohort, do you need US citizenship or permanent residency? If you don't have that, you are welcome to apply to our regular you know, four-year program and you can spend all four years here at the University of Queensland. I've got a, a question here. Um, how is the program affected by step one going past fail? How does that change matching rates? Thanks. Now, Angie, I know this isn't particularly in your area of expertise, but I, I'm sure you and your colleagues have possibly talked about this, or you may have heard Oshner colleagues talk about it. Is there anything you'd like to respond to that question? We, Are you directing that to me, Cecile, or Angie? Well, I was asking Angie, but Sue, if you wanted to, if you had anything to add to that? No, no, I want to hear what Angie has to say. Thank you. So I'm not sure about for phase one, what the options are for online. I know they, we, 
all have been taking additional precautions to allow for um, social distancing. I know here in Oshner, we have tried to do as many virtual um, lectures as possible. And I can't think of any that I had to like come in in person unless it was a very, very small group. So there are a lot of um, things done for that. We were not, we did not return. My class this year did not return to do a, um, a rotation in Australia. Um, and we, unfortunately this was like a US wide thing. There were no opportunities for away rotations this year because of the pandemic. And that was for every institution kind of shut that down to um, limit travel. But I don't know if either of you can speak more on for phase one. Well, thank you. And I think we've, we've also got a, a written response in the, in the chat from one of my other colleagues and so on. So I think move on to a question about class size. I'm asking about average class size, both in phase one and, and two. And I talked about the group, the size of the CBL group. So it, we do have a big medical school intake. And so you'll, you'll see all of, you know, your fellow um, med school classmates at orientation, but then really the main students that you're going to have contact with will be your CPL group, which is about 10, 12 students. But Angie, can I maybe ask you just to talk about, you know, when you are at Oshner, how many, you know, students would you um, see on a regular basis? Um, I get it kind of depends on what rotation you're on and if you're at a satellite location. So if I'm at a satellite location, sometimes it's just me. Um, and then when I'm on campus, pre-COVID times, probably um, sometimes I can be grouped with two other students on a rotation. So we spend a lot of time together. Um, but there's a lot of camaraderie in our uh, in our class. So we all like to collaborate to study together, share notes, um, even just random tips. We usually um, do like a mini handover to uh, the next incoming students coming in on the, our like whatever that particular rotation is. So there's a pretty heavy amount of interaction with the your fellow classmates. Thank you, that's great. I have a couple of questions about MCAT. So if you haven't taken MCAT yet and you add your score later to the application, the answer is yes, but as I mentioned, your application isn't assessed until it's complete. We are aware of the MCAT delays in 2021, and we just recently received a communication from the AAMC that they will be um, expediting the release of MCAT results um, for January tests and so on. So that'll be two week um, turnaround time instead of four weeks. So we monitor that quite closely. And this year we did proceed with inviting students to attend an MMI before they had sat MCAT because we didn't want them to be disadvantaged by the test cancellations and delays and so on. So if that happens again in 2021, we'll be responsive to, to any of the challenges that, that come. Um, again, if students ask me if we haven't taken the prerequisites, can we still submit an application and complete the prerequisites later? Absolutely, you, you can submit an application at any time, but just be aware that the, the assessment process will be longer if we haven't received all of the requirements. Got a question here asking, are there opportunities for students to work in Australia? Now, my first answer is yes. So your student visa allows you to work part-time um, when you're in Australia, full-time during any university break. But Angie, as from the student perspective, can I ask you to speak about, you know, whether you or you had others, you know, students who you knew worked in Australia while they're in Australia, perhaps what kind of jobs they undertook? Definitely. I know actually one of my colleague or cohort he came in a couple months earlier before um, school started and worked as a bartender just to kind of get to know the city better. I think he continued to work uh, while he was there. Um, I know some, uh, one of my friends actually worked as a bar instructor. So if you don't know what that is, it's just kind of like a ballet Pilates kind of uh, exercise class. Um, I was hired to be a Pilates instructor. Um, there's just there are a lot of opportunities you just kind of have to look out for them and just I guess get to know wh where you are and see what you're interested in. Great, thank you. Quite a student asking whether there's a campus location that we recommend and I, I should have mentioned in phase um, one 
the students are based at the main UQ campus at St. Lucia. So we're actually presenting today from the Hurston campus, which houses the main medical school building, the original foundation building for UQ medicine. Um, and it is accessible to UQ St. Lucia, you know, with public transport. Um, it's a bus that goes directly to the university. Our hope had been that when our colleague Sue Ross joined Oshner, that we would be able to host her to show her around campus. And I'm hopeful still that that can happen in, in 2021. But that leads me to a question about housing, off campus, you know, or off campus housing. And Angie, again, can I ask you to talk from a student experience perspective where you lived when you were in Brisbane and how you found accommodation? Sure. So um, I lived off campus. I lived in a neighborhood called Milton. In the building was called the Milton, and it's actually attached to um, the uh, tram, um, the train station. And that was incredibly convenient. And I didn't really have any issues with noise or anything like that. Um, at the time, it was kind of like a more up and coming neighborhood and we found this great um, gym that I really, my husband and I really liked and we also found this uh, nice little bar that we made friends with. Um, so they, like those people were so close to us that we actually invited them to our wedding. So we were just like, this is our like tiny little community that we really enjoyed. And so that's how we chose where to live. A lot of uh, students lived in South Brisbane. Um, we had a little mix of people who lived in on campus and off campus. I think a lot of us ended up moving off campus uh, in by second year though, because we want to just be more in the city and explore it before we had to go back to the US. Thank you. We've got some specific questions too about the application process. So, you know, really specific about transcripts, whether it's just from the school you graduated from or, all, you know, all the colleges that you had credit from. I'm going to say send in more rather than less. So if, otherwise it just saves an email where we ask for more information. Um, we, I get this question a lot as well. Like, we don't ask for letters of recommendation. We don't ask for personal statements. And I know that that is a big thing. Most US schools ask for a volume of information. And as I said before, during the presentation, our entry criteria is quite straightforward. And one of the reasons is that our program tends to attract a particular kind of students. And it's usually a student that, you know, possibly has traveled or has an interest in having some kind of a global experience as part of their medical school study. Um, you know, a student who maybe has an interest in global health and because this program will expose you to two different healthcare systems. Students that are, you know, maybe haven't taken that traditional pathway, you know, from undergraduate straight into medical school. And so what that means, because we're attracting that particular kind of student, we're not getting the volume of applications that most US medical schools get. And I, and I know from talking to colleagues, they get thousands. And so just looking at GPA or MCAT score isn't sufficient way to kind of differentiate between applicants because of the volume. So they get thousands, we would get hundreds. And so we don't need all of that supporting documentation to help us differentiate between our applicants because we have the resources to be able to you know, look at their applications closely. We really, you know, gauge the academic um, quality through the GPA and the MCAT. So for us, the multiple mini interview is the opportunity to get to know you better as a prospective medical student. We're, student. we're looking for students who have the best chance of success in our program, who are going to add to the richness of the diversity of experience and background in our medical student cohort. So I say to students, because I know you put a lot of work into your letters of recommendation, personal statements. It's not that we don't think it's important. It's just not information that we need to review as part of the application process. I'm going to come back to you, Angie, because we have another question about the transition. So how is the transition living in Australia, being from the US, particularly, I imagine you might have arrived directly from Madison, Wisconsin. So tell me about that first arrival in, in January in Brisbane. Okay, so this is kind of a funny story. I, d I flew in from Chicago um, in you know, the peak of winter and then got dropped into Brisbane in the peak of their summer. And they had like a very unusual heat wave that year too. So I'll be totally honest, that part was a bit rough, but otherwise it's a lot easier than you think. I had, I think like two like really big suitcases packed, um, mostly things that I 
didn't really want to replace. So like some clinical clothes, my laptop, some books, maybe I thought were appropriate, my stethoscope, stuff like that. And uh, set up an Airbnb and just started looking around for an apartment. I found my Airbnb was actually in the apartment building that I ended up uh, moving into. Um, and so it was um, pretty easy. I think um, allowing a little extra time before would have like made my stress level a little bit less so I would could like ease into it. But um, yeah, it was a lot easier than you think. There's not like a massive culture shock. Everybody was super friendly. Everything's easily accessible. Brisbane is an amazing walking city and their um, public transit is unbelievable. I honestly still think about it <laughs> now here in New Orleans, how much I miss it. Um, it's a gorgeous city. It's literally something that you feel like you see out of postcards. I didn't think they're like the transition is, I. I understand some like anticipatory anxieties about it, but when, if you just do it, there's like no problems, everything's fine. It was much easier than I think any of my class imagined. It was, I highly recommend doing it, even if separate from this, go travel. That's great. And I wonder, can I just ask a follow-up question? When you transitioned in from Brisbane to New Orleans, how was that experience? Also not too challenging. Um, there's you have your upperclassmen that are there with you or transitioning out. So there's a lot of, they give you a little welcome guide to giving you like a heads up on where's a good place to live or maybe even taking over somebody else's rent. Um, not too challenging. I think really um, some people just were like, I gotta get a car. Sorry, my cat wants to be get in the camera. <laughs> um, you know, that might be a little bit it. I think the toughest part was balancing um, coming home, studying for step. Some people moved right to New Orleans. So they didn't have to worry about it and they could just focus on step studies. I did not. I like stayed with my mother-in-law, uh, my mother, or my parents, -in -law, my in-laws, I guess is what you would say it. Sorry. <laughs> my in-laws studied and then moved. Um, it's just kind of like up to you what's easier, but it really, you have like a really great support system. This cohort is unreal in how supportive they are for each other, for everybody. And so you're always gonna get a lot of help. People are looking out for you. We make changes to this welcome packet every year to add things in, take things out. So the transitions are a lot easier than you would expect. Great, thank you. And now Sue, I'm gonna put you on the spot. Considering this is my you know, final webinar before I hand over to you, I wonder how much you knew about Australia before you, know, you decided to apply for a job working with the you know, uh, American Australian medical program. Well, actually, thank you, Cecile, for that question. <laughs> um, I actually do not know very much about Australia at all, other than what you see on television through movies. You get to see some of the landscape and uh, know some of the your native actors and actresses. So without movies or anything like that, I, I wouldn't know anything, but I did see a documentary on dangerous animals that live in Australia. <laughs> and, and I was surprised that some of the things that I saw, I have lots of questions for you about that actually. One was a frog and I didn't know frogs were poisonous. <laughs> so, um, I, so I'm very interested in, in seeing everything. I, I knew about the Great Barrier Reef and I like the water. So I'm excited to find out about that as well. I hear there's great wines, right? There is actually, we're very fortunate. We've got great food and great wine and that. Um, we've got some more specific questions, not just about you know, life in Australia and that. So asking about the semesters and classes so, you know, phase one, phase two are structured differently. Um, so for specific dates and details, you can access the academic calendar on our website. So you can see the breakdown, um, you know, of the semesters in phase one. And then in, in phase two, the clinical rotations vary from six to eight weeks, depending on which medical discipline um, you're, you're undertaking at that time. Got a question saying in New Orleans, where can you go to get more information about the application process for the, for the MD and this four year journey? And I would say, I mean, your all of the information, uh, you know, on, for both institutions is available on our website. That's the best resource. Um, and then feel free to reach out 
you know, directly to the enrollment management team and we can answer via email or as I said, you know, through a one-to-one -one Zoom chat. Um, that. Okay, Angie, I'm going to come back to you. I, I think you mentioned your husband before you mentioned your cat. Have students been able to bring their significant others with them to Australia? What is the visa process like for family committed couples? Okay, yes. Um, you can't, your partner can come with you. So there are a couple different visa options and I'll try to go over them quickly. Um, one is that they can do a partner visa. So this is kind of like an all-encompassing visa. It just kind of tags onto your student visa, but it can be a little bit expensive. Another option for them is that they can apply for a holiday visa. This is a temporary visa and I think it can go up to two years, but you have to be under 31 to apply for it. My husband missed that margin, so he did not. So what he did instead was he came on um, just like a tra regular traveler's visa, like as a tourist, um, and then just started applying everywhere and was looking for a company to sponsor him. And eventually he did get that. So you can kind of do any of these routes um, to get your partner to come with you. And I think it's not uncommon. And I think much like you said about your experience in come to Brisbane, there is a lot of, you know, stress and anxiety based around, you know, how does this work and so on. I think, you know, the, the one of the best times to, other students have done it. So some students come with a spouse or a significant other, other ones now come alone and possibly meet their spouse or significant other in the program and so on. We've seen that happen over the years. So, you know, just, just be aware that you're not the first one coming on this journey and so there's a, a well-laid path you know and support to, to help you you know with that um we've got a question asking about you as the lead step one first pathway we did have that on one of our slides um and so um, i'll refer you you know to that information the webinar will be available as a recording we also have that information available um, on our website we're coming um, down to the end of time. I'm still happy to take some more questions on the on the chat line, but I'm just wondering in terms of any kind of final messages. Sue, is there anything that you, you want to share, you know, with the prospective applicants for the 2022 intake? I know, you know, you'll have some online activities, you know, um, through into next year as well. Um, anything you'd like to tell these guys? Yes, thank, thank you so much, Cecile. Uh, I want to let you, everyone know that I am actually new in my position, so I am still learning as I go every day, and I am thankful to be here because I found that the Ashna group, whether it's colleagues or the students that are in, on campus, everyone is extremely helpful, kind, and supportive in every way, and the students will even stop in and just to say hello and introduce themselves to me and talk about their journey, so it's I can say that that New Orleans is a warm and friendly city, but it's emphasized at Ashner and uh, and you'll feel it. It's just in the air when you're there about how much everyone cares about everyone else. So I am trying to plan a very robust recruitment season for throughout 2021 for our 2022 in, intake class. And it's going to be a variety of things. I'll be working with Brian to put forth the information of the programming. I'll be hosting um, virtual info sessions at various schools throughout the US. And I'll be participating in graduate fairs and conferences. And we're going to start a new initiative called White Coat Wednesday, where I interview one of our white coat people could be a current student, it could be an alum, a resident, or someone, mostly it's going to be our current students, our third years and fourth years. So they could talk about their journey or the specialty that they chose, or how did they navigate the waters of med school and USMLE and everything that you have to go through in a, a, when you decide to take a career in medicine. So I'm excited about launching that initiative. Thank you, and I think I can vote for the warm and friendly people as well. It's been really gratifying over the decade of our partnership to seeing the collegiate um, relationships and, and friendships actually that are formed between UQ and Oshner colleagues. We're getting some specific questions through on chat about 
MCAT's and so on, a student asking, can I take the March MCAT still be eligible for the application? Absolutely. The majority of our applicants will actually sit MCAT, you know, in the, that first, you know, few months of 2021. Um, and so there will still be places available in the quota. We will run multiple offer rounds next year. So a March MCAT test date will be fine. And Jeff, I'm going to come to you now and ask for some final comments. And I, I, I'd like to sort of ask, um, is there something that you wish you'd known before you, you know, applied to the UQ Austrian Peak program, came to Australia? It's something that you look back now and you think, hey, I wish somebody had told me this, you know, before, before I started. It's a good question. Um, I think when you first start, Actually, the best advice I got, I think I'll share that instead. The first, the best advice I got was, um, you know, you, you work so hard to get into med school. You constantly have to defend why you're good enough, why you deserve to be here. And you just kind of get this like air of like, I, like, I know everything. Like, that's why I got here. I earned my spot here. And you really got to take a step back and remember that, um, uh, you applied here to be a student and your first job is to be teachable and to learn. So, um, you know, the best students are the ones that are trying, are constantly trying to learn and just like seize up any opportunity that you can learn about your patients. Like if you don't really understand how, why this pathology or physiology works, like keep on digging because I think that's like what makes great physicians. And so um, don't, don't forget that this career means that you're going to be learning for the rest of your life. So make sure that that's, that's what you're in for. Thank you. That is great advice. And so a big thank you to whoever provided that advice to you. I'm going to end there. I think those are great words to end on. Please feel free to reach out after the webinar with any further questions you might have. And I thank my fellow panelists, Sue Barras and Angie Hinchman. And I'd also like to thank my UQ colleagues who have been here for pretty much every webinar that I've presented this year. So Brian Mallon, who's in the room with me, but off camera. And another colleague who's in another part of, of our campus, Sean Hill from St. Clair. We look forward to welcoming as many of you as we can in 2022. So thank you, everyone. Bye-bye.